Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter and producer at The World covering global health. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about curbing misinformation about COVID-19. With me is Dr. Vish Viswanath, a professor of health communication at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Vish, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And you can also post your questions for us on Facebook at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and The World from PRX and WGBH. So we're we are doing this through Zoom and Facebook. Thank you for your patience. Vish, I wanted to start, you know, earlier this month, the UN Secretary General denounced a quote, pandemic of misinformation surrounding COVID-19. The World Health Organization has called uh, out concerns about a quote, infodemic, just a deluge of information and misinformation right now. There are, um, you know, messages about miracle cures, conspiracy theories, racist speech all happening right now. And so to start off, I wanted to ask about what is it that stands out for you right now? What sort of misinformation are you studying? Um, I think there are, there, are, uh, there are two types that we should distinguish. You know, it's, it's very important to distinguish with, between them. So one is misinformation um, and, and some of it is uh, unintentional. You know, I think people are trying to make sense of the world, especially on an emerging infectious disease like this, where uh, there is very limited knowledge and no treatment, no vaccination. So people are trying to make sense of it uh, and, and people are trying to understand uh, and, and pass it on to their friends, people in their networks, information they think they have heard from someone else. Uh, and that is one type of information, uh, you know, which is not accurate. So we can call it and characterize it as misinformation. But I think the the what the secret, uh, you know, director general of WHO and others uh, are referring to uh, is active disinformation, uh, you know, where um, people are, uh, you know, intentionally peddling uh, inaccurate information, uh, you know, uh, when and taking advantage of the situation. And there we are seeing. Um, uh, two particular types, there are more types too, but two particular types stand out. One is uh, you know, the, the miracle cures, as you said. Uh, and this is not very new uh, in the sense that we always had the so-called quote-unquote snake oil salesman. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. If you go back and uh, look at advertising history, we always had people offering uh, all kinds of peddling, all kinds of cures, miracle cures. I think, you know, this is kind of an extension of that. What is different here is that the scale at which you can do it and the speed volume uh, at which you can do it, right? So that's the difference, it's a big difference. But the second type of disinformation is, the, uh, is, is a certain uh, social groups, uh, ideologically driven uh, groups, whether it is state actors or uh, that is governments are non-state actors actively spreading inaccurate falsehoods uh, to so spread uh, uh, so seeds of doubt and division among people. So that's what we are uh, seeing right now. You know? This is going to seem like a really basic question. And it sounds like as someone that studies this communication, misinformation, I imagine you weren't surprised to see this, but why would there be these forces at play? Like, what is the motivation to seed disinformation? So, uh, you know, this is one of those uh, pandemics. I think there are two, let me offer two propositions, I think, you know. So one, I, I have said this before, the, uh, so I'm repeating what I said earlier. This is the first pandemic of the information age, of the social media age of its kind, you know, where, you know, within a very short span of time, four months, really, right? December, it was not so long ago. Uh, within four months, we have seen the entire world uh, ground to a halt in some ways. Um, as, as I think, you know, that's what is so different about this, you know, because of 
of of the uh you know that kind of a concentrate you know everything happening in a very concentrated period of time is what is shocking mm. and and what is causing or leading to this kind of a um you know explosion of of this kind of information so what's happening in my view the second proposition is that a uh, a group of people have seen an opening to further their own ideological agenda whether it is anti vaccine groups whether it is pro gun groups whether it is uh, right wing anti immigrant groups or whether it is states uh, or state actors certain governments who, who find it very convenient to uh, you know to 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 use this so i think all these groups have found an opening and some of them are collaborating maybe some of them are not necessarily collaborating but it's a confluence of interest among them that is really leading them uh, to come together to to spread this information one mm. last point on this elena is that the i think unlike in other crises we don't have a lot of answers the right. answers are only evolving every day right because the science is not settled so that's even a bigger opening when people are hungry to make sense you know to uh, to help pe- to help people make sense you know so with this disinformation so we are all hungry to make sense of it and it sounds like it's really interesting to hear you contextualize this and like this is the first massive big spread of a contagious disease on a world level in this information age. So in light of that you have a lab and a dashboard where you're trying to kind of monitor these things but also um provide some useful guidance for how to manage social media during this time. Um what are some ways that you advise people or how you manage social media during this time and how to use it, how to make sense of the information that's out there? Right. So uh so the reason we created the dashboard is because um uh, as i said because the science is developing so fast you know usually when scientists publish papers um you know nobody pays attention you know a few reviewers read it uh, over a period of time you know people start paying attention by the time the findings results actually percolate to day to day practice it takes years if not decades but unlike in the past for this situation everybody is very anxious about science and every day there is a new scientific finding new paper that's been <coughs> published excuse me so what is what we found out is because it's daily dose of science du jour finding du jour it's really confusing people Mm-hmm. right this is the way science works but people don't always understand that science takes a lot of time to develop that consensus here the scrutiny is palpable every day right there the most public scrutiny of science that you have ever seen so we realized right away in talking in having conversations that people started wondering how to make sense of this science and whether every new scientific finding is relevant to their day to day life so that impelled us to say okay what is it that is relevant to me today to lead my life what mm-hmm. science is relevant and particularly those of us who focus on the underserved groups felt that this is really overwhelming when they are already dealing with unemployment layoffs furloughs children being at home to also wonder to you not know, really sift uh, the chaff from the wheat so to speak so that's when we created this dashboard to make sense of the information the day to day science that the science that they need that day at that point in time and no more number one and in the process we discovered social media contribute quite a bit because this is the pandemic of the social media age in in in, in spreading this uh, uh, misinformation disinformation and information so we were trying to make an attempt to somehow let people know why if they are using social media they have to be very careful about it and that's the reason we we suggested uh, this mnemonic of think essentially asking people to step back before you are trigger happy or finger happy and forward every message that comes to you can you step back a little bit 
and think about the source of this message. Is it really a credible information? Is it somebody you trust? Is it really going to be helpful uh, to other people? When you buy a car, when you and go, I buy a car, we think about it carefully. We go out, we investigate, we ask people before we make the decision. But in somehow in this case, there is, uh, you know, we are, we are very eager to spread that information. That's what we were trying to do, just to make them think a little bit before they uh, spread that information. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 whether it works or not is a different issue because um, I mean, I will be happy to talk about why it's not likely to work or whether it is unfair to put the burden only on individuals, but certainly individuals have a role to play, I think. Um, you know, you mentioned some differences of what makes now so different, and we are getting a lot of questions, um, and some of these are coming up in what you're talking about. But how, like, is this kind of misinformation, dis despite, like, the level and scale, how does it compare how, with COVID-19 to other recent outbreaks, whether it's H1N1 or, you know, SARS from two Right, right. So, uh, so number one, uh, if you, um, the, the, if, if you go back to uh, H1N1 or SARS, they started in two different geographic regions or MERS, you know, right? And then spread across the world. But the spread was less fast, less speedier, mm -hmm. number one. That's one. Number two, even if you take the latest one, which is MERS, you know, uh, the, the penetration of social media was not as high compared to what it is today. Today, globally, people are on social media in one way or other, depending up, it depends on what platform it is, but they're all on social media. So that's what makes a difference. The speed at which it spread, because it's a global world, we have heard that cliche before, it's a globalized economy. I think the, 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 the speed and the penetration of media, social media, I think makes it different from other crises we have seen. And it sounds like the uncertainty now makes it trickier, but the types of misinformation or disinformation do follow a similar trend of whether it's ideological groups or groups, and also then like the medical kind of uh, miracle cure kind of, pro like that to you does seem to be a similar thread. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, a couple of points on that too, right? So this is what we call as emerging infectious disease. And it takes time, as you know, to understand the contours of the disease, why it's happening, what is happening, what are the consequences, uh, how can we develop, a, uh, how can we mitigate it, whether it's vaccination or treatment, uh, et cetera. Uh, here, uh, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have treatment yet, um, but it is spreading very fast. The other thing uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, contributing to this is, I don't, I cannot think of an example right now where the entire economy has ground to a halt, right? I don't think where 7 billion people in the world are paying attention to this one issue at right. one time and have been directly affected by it, right? That's very unusual, I think. And mm -hmm. that's what makes it so different, you know? So. so there are a lot of questions that are coming in and I want to get to some real specifics. This one is from online. And it the question begins that um, there was a recent study from researchers at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and it found that half of the Twitter accounts spreading COVID-19 misinformation were actually bots. So what do we know about these kind of bots? Who's actually directing them? And what kind of information are they pushing? Um, and on top of that, how are social media platforms? responding right uh, this is a great question because this is a question we say these are great questions because we don't have good answers for them <laughs> right so if you think about it um and, and uh, so the carnegie mellon study is one of the latest in, in this line of studies which are now emerging uh, whether it was our 2016 elections uh, but also in this context um, the the suspicion is that it is coming from state actors. They have not been able to completely confirm it, uh, but they are suspecting that certain governments in the world 
are involved in actively spreading this information because the scale and the speed at which they are being produced, the volume and velocity, as we say in big data, at which these are being produced can, cannot be done by human beings. They can only be done by some kind of an algorithmic basis. So it is certain state actors who are engaging in this. That is a suspicion. At least that's what we are suspecting. Now, that's why I felt when I said, you know, I should, uh, it is unfair to place the entire burden on people Mm -hmm. on social media to say, don't be finger happy, restrain yourself. Because in my view, it is very difficult to put the entire burden and responsibility on people or individuals. In my view, something at this scale can be tackled only technologically and mm -hmm. institutionally. That's why social media platforms have a very important role to play. On this issue, I would give them mixed grades. You know, on the one hand, they are, some of them at least are trying, right? When we, when we pointed out the explicitly inaccurate anti-vaccine information, some social media platforms have made a decision to discourage that. Mm -hmm. this, but they are being very reactive in my view. So, if you, if you have if the scale is of such kind, social media platforms should be more proactive on this thing because it's only they who have the resources, the wherewithal, right? The technological and the institutional prowess to stem something like this. You and I can do it. We can, we can uh, you know, individually uh, do everything we can or try restrain ourselves but at the scale at which this is happening, social media platforms have to come forward. So far, my feeling is that they have been very reactive. They act only when they have been pointed out, like the pandemic movie, documentary, whatever you want to call it, you know, that was spreading around and they have been told they have to be, their attention has to be drawn to it. I think that's very difficult. How many think tanks, how many groups can continue to monitor and do this? So the, I think it is the role of the social media platforms to be much more aggressive and much more proactive on this thing. Hmm. You know, you mentioned um, anti-vax movements, and that leads to another question, um, which ties into the earlier conversation about, you know, certain ideological groups or certain things that have been present before this pandemic. But this question from online um, is that before COVID-19, groups like the anti-vax movement have social media networks for disseminating information that's skeptical of doctors, of pharmaceuticals, um, and often promoting this value of like natural immunity. So is there a relationship between this movement and ideas and the misinformation now that's spreading around COVID-19? So getting a little bit more specific. Yeah, I think, uh, uh... What is different in this situation is the uh, anti-vaccine groups um, always had social media, uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, networks of their own, and they have posted them. Uh, in some cases, they have been able to reach beyond uh, their own immediate network. So that is that by itself is not new, I think. In my view, what is new is finding that common cause. Right. So there are a lot of groups who are protesting um, uh, the, clo uh, the lockdowns, the, the shelter at home advisories, uh, etc. Right. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So a number of these groups, whether it is an anti-immigrant group, whether it is a pro-gun group, whether it is uh, a particularly ideologically driven group, uh, as I said earlier, I think what is happening is uh, they have found a common enemy, that is the state, the government, and and that common enemy is so it's kind of a uh, as a, the phrase I used is confluence of interests, uh, and I think they are finding that common ground among each other, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, deliberately or not deliberately, attacking this state uh, government, uh, you know, government actors, uh, and that's what is different, I think, in this time around. Uh, particularly, 
uh, if you think about it, we are talking a lot about vaccines, right? Again, we always talk a little bit about immunization and we would talk about vaccines when there is an outbreak of measles somewhere. But right now, everybody is waiting with a bated breath on a vaccine, right? People are receptive in the right type of mind. This is a good time also to talk about bad things, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in terms of talking about bad things, I wonder about this question that came from online, the lessons around um, communication having to do, excuse me, with climate change. Um, you know, there's this question um, point is that it's beginning to remind me of the debate around climate change, what we're looking at with COVID-19. Um, and there's broad scientific consensus, for example, but a lot of political polarization around it. So what can we learn from that? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting analogy. I've been thinking about this too, right? So, so there is science and there is politics. Mm -hmm. In general, they have run parallel to each other, though it is somewhat naive to think scientists are apolitical or all science is non-political. Let me put it that way. Uh, and, and certainly there has always been some intersection and overlap, but in general, those two were, have, have moved in parallel, I think. Climate change is one where they are now conflated with each other, right? There is a great overlap. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and there is a lot of consensus on climate change among scientists, uh, but, uh, but you know, it has become quote unquote politicized. Uh, and, and that's what is happening with this. And my feeling, and again, I don't have empirical evidence, but what is happening in both places, I think, uh, I mean, there are similarities and differences. The similarities are that the, the recommendations stemming from climate change, science, or the recommendations stemming from COVID-19 will have a direct impact on people, hmm. right? Uh, so, for example, you might say, I might want to increase uh, carbon tax, right? That has a direct impact on people. You might want to reduce you know, uh, fossil fuels consumption. That has a direct impact on people. It, uh, and economy, it's the same thing with COVID-19. The difference is that we don't have a consensus on why or the science, we are still developing the consensus, but the impact is immediate, if you see it, right? When, you are, when your business closes, yeah, I'm out of a job right away. And so therefore, I think there is that, that um, interaction uh, is very quick and immediate, unlike in other crises, and that's what is happening here. Um, I, I think whether it is in climate change, and there are people who have done a lot of thinking, um, uh, so I should be very careful in what I say, uh, or in this case, we, we have to develop that consensus uh, around what actions are necessary and what actions are not necessary. Uh, if I may, let me say this is, this particular crisis is a good example. It calls for a global leadership. Mm. If you think about it, if you are going to take or make decisions that's going to affect the livelihood of 7 billion people directly or indirectly, no part of the world is immune from it, directly or indirectly, this calls for a global leadership where leaders could come together and make certain decisions, even if they don't agree with all the decisions, at least there is some kind of a consensus. And the lack of consensus you know, is what is, you know, I think, you know, causing all the problems now. I just want to um, take a moment to remind viewers and um, listeners that this is a Facebook Live conversation um, with Vish Viswanath and I'm Alana Gordon and you can post and add your questions to, uh, uh, to the conversation. We want to hear from you too. Um, so this is a follow-up question from Paul. Um, is it reasonable then for state actors like the US or EU to build algorithms or authorized bots to spread valid information or reply to the disinformation bots? Um, so that's a question about bots, but I have a follow-up question about the broader leadership questions and what happened. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, you know, the, I mean, it would be very easy for me to say the state actors should uh, start building bots 
you know, uh, but I can easily immediately run into issues because of the value systems of each country, right? You know, I think in, if you are in the US, uh, immediately we have certain rules. Uh, First Amendment does not allow the state to play a very active role, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you can immediately see a lot of people being threatened by it. Uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, we have to have some degree of skip, uh, caution in asking platforms uh, to, to go in and intervene very aggressively because then it raises issues of censorship, uh, you know. So I think there is appropriate degree of caution. On the other hand, there are states, there are countries where it is perfectly acceptable for state governments or governments to go in and do certain things. Uh, so, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very difficult question in that sense. My, my, my response would be that powerful actors uh, with institutional resources should come together to develop that consensus and say, to so define this is a danger, this is a threat, and we have to act in concert with each other. Uh, uh, especially when you see a threat like this. We have done that before. When we see a hurricane, state actors come together with private actors to take actions. Uh, so, so if we are seeing this global threat, I think it is, it, it is perfectly reasonable for them to come together to do that. You know, so. um, this question comes from online, kind of taking it foot back to um, people um, in the midst of this. Um, the science is changing so quickly, or we, we're in an age of a lot of preprints and all sorts of things. It's hard to keep up, as you mentioned earlier, um, in terms of the changing information, making it more difficult um, to root out. Um, and you know, this question is, does that speed make it difficult? And then with that, how do you manage that? How do you find and suss out the information that is helpful and truthful? Yeah, I, I think the, the um, as I said earlier, uh, the, uh, you know, it takes years for science or findings or results from science to percolate to day-to-day -day practice uh, as in decades or at least a couple of years. Uh, and, and that has inbuilt filters and processes every step of the way, right? The peer review process of fellow scientists looking at your uh, studies and determining whether those studies are worth publishing or not. Then there are standard journalism practices. Most journalists have certain rules, professional practices, which allow them to decide or at least use some uh, decision rules to judge whether it is worth publishing or not, right? You know, so there, are, and all that helps in putting out papers in general, not always, in general, in, in, in you know, a science that is more consensus oriented, in, with some, of course, there are exceptions. I do see a problem with the way science is happening now. The problem stems from the fact that it is happening every day. Every day we are publishing dozens of papers all over the world we do not know the extent to which they are undergoing rigorous review by fellow scientists because we are so anxious to know about this. And, and I must say, we will be wrong. Others have said it. It's not an original thought. Others have said it. We are more likely to be wrong. What we published in February, we may be saying in April, we were wrong when we published it. And that is the nature of science. Science always contests internally and disproves findings, that's previous studies. Uh, but the problem is this is also public. And that is what is making it difficult to manage. So there are, what are the solutions for this? Uh, I don't think there is an easy solution, uh, but, and this is, it's not easy. We need consensus. It doesn't help when political actors contradict science so openly and start peddling uh, wrong scientific information, right? That makes it even more difficult. I keep going back to this notion of consensus. I'm not naive, right? I'm not that naive. But what I'm saying is that at more than at any other time, given the magnitude of the decision-making that is taking place, you know, 
we need actors state private sector government scientific sector to come together to make some of these decisions to say what is needed what is the science we have what is needed what is the best way to use that science in policy uh, i i think it is happening in a, in an environment where there is already a greater divisiveness greater distrust and that is what is making it difficult yeah we're uh, seeing a lot of politicization of studies and numbers and statistics based on these huge pressures whether it's opening the economy or other right, things right um regina was asking about this online about like who's when it comes to all the peer reviews and everything else there are these conversations that happen within scientists and now we have the public weighing in politicians but whose responsibility is it to monitor this sort of thing i know you mentioned like there has to be consensus in actors but is it the university is it peer commentaries like how do you see that translation yeah so there are there are two sides to this right uh you know uh, it's it's amazing just like our front uh, line healthcare workers who are working day in and day out there are scientists are doing incredible work right i mean they are working under tremendous pressure it's also great that they are getting a lot of attention and uh, including social scientists you can't wait 2 years right now absolutely sharing that information absolutely and they are working and they're sincerely working hard to get it out as quickly as possible with all great intentions however i think that comes with certain responsibility and this is where i think institutions that are consumers of science right in the governments for example have a responsibility to say okay the scientists are going to do what they are what we are asking them to do what is our job in interpreting these science right the called so called knowledge brokers right uh, you know are we sent are, are the policy makers scientifically literate enough to take this science that is being published and say what kind of steps can we take based on what we know today because we can't afford to wait but the other thing i want to add to this is you cannot make the decision on your own you have to bring other powerful people along with you right and explain it to people i have always argued in public communication transparency is very critical which means you have to get up there bring people along with you including other sectors otherwise you know you you'll continue to have people suspect your motives we are getting ready to wrap up and there are so many questions and follow up questions from um here that i hope we can continue but i want to get to this one um it comes from online the question is i'm confronted with false information when i'm confronted with false information that i see about covid-19 is it better to try to um refute it or ignore it um if i try to refute someone to a conspiracy theory out there i'm worried i may just be bringing more attention to it uh-huh. actually there is interesting scientific support for that argument uh the refutation doesn't always work you know because when you refute you have to repeat number one the falsehood and then you refute it so by sheer repetition of that falsehood will leave people at least some memory trace right you know okay so there seems to be you know uh, you know when it is a, a especially repeated you know so people over time forget the details and they will remember that vague connection between those two things so this is a great question uh, you know uh, i i think uh, uh, contestation you don't want falsehoods to be kept uh, go uncontested but i think there is an emerging consensus on how to refute it in a very thoughtful careful way so that you don't repeat the falsehood making sure that the facts are salient out there before you repeat the myths i think or the falsehood uh, that may be one way to do that you know so yeah finally i wanted to ask you um before we do wrap up um and maybe there's a way tactfully to talk about this without creating a sort of belief echo but um what is the biggest lie you've seen out there about covid-19 i it it depends on what uh, country you are in and what platform you are in um uh, i think uh, one um, and this worries me uh, i think one of the falsehoods i am seeing is this, uh, uh, around how the virus itself emerged um uh, and and we will have an investigation at some point we will learn how exactly it, it jumped from the 
uh, bats to animals. Uh, uh, we will have, we will know uh, eventually. Uh, we may know, uh, we may not, but we may know. Uh, but the the other component of that is is worrisome. That's kind of a bigotry that it is fostering, right? Mm-hmm. So certain groups, certain countries, certain people are are responsible for it for spreading it, uh, and that's what that's one of the things that has that has really. Uh, big, one of the biggest falsehoods I have seen. Hmm. The other falsehood is this kind of a peddling of miracle cures. Uh, you know, it, it. You know, the the interesting point about this is we are worried not about those who peddle or those who believe in it. You cannot change their mind. You know, but it is this fence sitter, so to speak. It is this middle group of people who don't have a lot of time. To pay attention to every falsehood out there, who are busy with their own lives, right? It is those people, you know, that could be particularly susceptible, right? If it is continues to be repeated, and this kind of, a, you know, especially when they are trying to make sense of this, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so this peddling uh, of of this, uh, you know, miracle cures, I think, you know, is having some, as as you have been reading, uh, you know, some serious consequences on the health of the people. I think those are the two big baskets of, you know, uh, falsehoods I've been seeing, you know, that worry me. Has it surprised you? Uh, the, uh, again, uh, what surprises me is the, is the velocity or the scale and the speed at which it is happening. Uh, you know, there are real issues that one should worry about. Uh, m- hundreds of millions of poor people are out of jobs, are struggling every day. Um, trying to make sense of it, trying to live through their lives, those issues are not coming out. There are certain groups which are disproportionately affected by this crisis. Those are not coming out. What is coming out, what is being paid more attention to are these kinds of falsehoods, Uh, especially the scale surprises me. I think the speed, uh, not the falsehoods themselves. Well, Vish, thank you so much for this conversation and for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so that about wraps up our conversation. Um, that does conclude our Facebook conversation. Thank you so much again. Um, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's TH Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and WGBH. You can, full, you can view this full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback at forum, HSPH, and at PRI, the world.